Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Patient Convert Podcast. I'm really excited doing a little podcast swap. I've got Kenneth Burke here. He is with Text Request, and we have done actually a lot of collaboration on content over the years. And I was um, fortunate enough he invited me on their podcast. But I'm really excited, Kenneth, to have you on and talk about a topic we really have not talked about yet on the podcast, and that is the whole world of text messages. So, Kenneth, introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about Text Request, and I look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, well, Justin, thanks for having me on. Always exciting to talk with you. So, I'm the VP of Marketing here for Text Request. Text Request is a business text messaging platform to help you ignite customer engagement, or in this case, specifically to ignite patient engagement. And so, essentially, what we do is we give you plug and play solutions so that your team can securely have conversations and share updates with patients. Excellent. Excellent. So kind of jumping right into it, patient engagement has always been a hot topic, but I think it's really been on fire, especially with COVID digitizing kind of the whole healthcare process, uh, like ripping a bandaid off. And then everyone immediately was concerned with not just patient engagement as it relates to your waiting room times, but your virtual waiting room times and your website and all that stuff. So I'd love to hear kind of With what y'all are doing and just kind of in general is how can text messaging be leveraged to kind of improve the patient engagement and kind of patient experience? Yeah, so we can we can use COVID as a a jumping point because as as everyone saw, you know, contactless engagement, that was the buzzword we heard a lot, became a hot topic, you know, March of 2020. People had to, on all sides, had to figure out how to adjust from you know face-to-face interactions to virtual in some way. And then it was a question of what does virtual look like? Can that be text messaging? Is it? Does it have to be video? You know, is it all through email or something else? And, and figuring that out. And so you know what, what we've seen and then how it would apply to medical offices is basically people want to text for simple communications or even for complex communications. And it's, you know, it's the number one most used app on their phones. It's, it fits into, you know, schedules. It's more flexible. You can, you know, you don't have to wait on a website to have a conversation, so to speak. You can send a message, do your thing, come back to it later. And so anyway, so we saw people, uh, you know, kind of broadening their minds to, okay, well, what are all the different use cases or ways this could be, this could be used? So the first one, contactless engagement was for virtual check-ins. So instead of coming into a waiting room, talking to the front desk and saying, Hey, I'm here, you know, let me sign my paper. It was, you know, you, you pull up in your car into the parking lot. There's a sign outside that says, Hey, text this number whenever you're here. And then we'll respond to you whenever it's time for you to walk into the office. And, you know, someone will come and unlock the door for you often. I kind of like buying groceries. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, we saw that. It was really interesting too from from our seat because we saw that across industry. So anywhere where you had an in-person interaction, we saw retail stores using it, trying to stay open. You know, so I'm thinking even medical, you know, uh, uh, like ophthalmologists selling eyewear. Uh, we saw it for you know banking and finance, but anyway, so that that was one easy one. And then you look at okay, well, if that works for kind of replacing the the in person interaction there until we actually you know come in and see someone, where else can it work? You see that it works really well for getting new patients in the door. You know, you're spending a ton of money on advertising and marketing to get people to your website or even just word of mouth and referrals. You know, we saw people adding text messaging to their website so that people would text them directly there and set up appointments. We saw it for obviously scheduling and, and confirmations. That's for years has helped reduce no shows by half or to help uh, fill last minute appointments. And then you see it, you know, kind of on the tail end too of getting reviews and feedback following up for payments, because that's always, you know, the collections department or payment or accounts receivable is always busier than you want them to be. And then, you know, promotions and ongoing relationships. So there, there's a lot there we can dive into. You just let me know where you want to go. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think that's the beauty, honestly, of capitalism and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurism in general is what was interesting during COVID is, and I think what's come out on the other end is going to be an improvement in the whole healthcare ecosystem. I think kind of commerce in general, but it definitely even more solidified 
the consumerism of healthcare in terms of like what you see now, what you mentioned, like website texting, texting when you're at the door, like all of that stuff that you see, like we just talked about in retail and you've seen grocery stores with pickup like Walmart and Publix doing it for a long time is all of a sudden there was a heavy of adoption to that because I think in the long run, it's what the consumer has been looking for, but there's been no pressure on healthcare to deliver it. And then COVID happened and then there was an immediate required um, delivery of that, which I think will be for the betterment long term of healthcare. And it'll make, I think, a happier patient and and improve patient care too, I think, in the long run. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. I mean, we've seen for years, you know, we've seen consumers want mobile, they want digital, they want flexible engagement. There's myriad ways, you know, that can show itself, but that's what people want. You know, they want it more on their time. They want it more on the go. They want it more flexible. They, we have these supercomputers in our pockets now. They want things on our phone. And yeah, it, it was interesting to see it. It, it just kind of come to light. You know, people have a whole change of heart overnight. And I, I agree. I think it'll be, I think one thing that's come from it, a takeaway we say is, you know, people aren't going to unlearn convenience. Yeah, that is 100% true. Yes. And these digital communications have become incredibly convenient for a lot of people. And so it, it's going to become just kind of an ongoing expectation. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. What have you seen? Because I think that there's, and we hear this a lot, especially just as simple of a use for text messages, like building patient reviews or, or whatever it may be. There seems to always be this pushback, especially as you cross, say, the 65 and older baby boomer about, well, they may not have, which I think is a ridiculous statement. I don't even know if you can buy a flip phone anymore, but like they're not going to have a phone that has text messages and capabilities and they're not going to know how to function it. It's like, my my dad is in his 70s and retired and he uses an iPad. Like if you're that sophisticated, you can handle text message. But what have you seen? Because the patient portal pro- problem was the same thing as everyone said, well, patients that are over 50 are not going to be able to, to get their records and manage a patient portal. And the adoption difference has been like 1% between under 50 and over. Have y'all seen a similar thing or has it kind of been what they thought it would be in terms of the adoption of text message across kind of age groups? We, we've seen it pretty similar. I mean, as you get older, I mean, yeah, I, 65 to 70 is kind of where we start to see it taper off where it's not so much that they, they can't or they won't. They just choose not to in some cases, you know, yeah. they just, they prefer, you know, the days when you used, I think of, you know, there's a jokes about you used to have company over, you know, no one has just company drop by anymore. Right. Yeah. But just kind of that, that mindset of, yeah, well, I need to interact with so-and-so I'm going to physically go to them and see them in person. That's just kind of a preference. So you think it's more of kind of like wanting the bank teller at the bank still kind of like the resistance of change, less about the adaption of technology and more of like, it doesn't feel as personalized to me as I'm used to um, like going into the drugstore like it used to be or something like that. That has been my experience and habit as a part of that too. The other side of it is there are a lot of, particularly when you get more into kind of an enterprise level, there are a lot of technologies or patient portals that are the opposite of user friendly. And so, yeah, that is for sure. It, you know, in a lot of a lot of cases, it's not that there's a resistance to change or that people don't want an easier way of doing things or a quicker way. You know, I mean, if you could tell me I could save an hour in the car and do something from my couch, everyone's okay with that. Yep. But if the technology or the portal is simply difficult or confusing, or as is sometimes the case in healthcare, intentionally unhelpful, uh, I think of like insurance companies, you know, you know, that creates a frustration, which leads to a lack of adoption. And that's the same case. I mean, that would be the same in any industry. But what we see and the the stats back this up, I mean, Pew Research Center is one, the CTIA has a, a a bunch of research on this too. Adoption is pretty consistent for how how often people text and how often they use their smartphones and for what use cases they use their smartphones. It's really interesting now across generations and across demographics. So it's, it's kind of just a, a part of us now. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. So another outside of the age thing, I'd say a, a, a very common concern or thing that's brought up is the HIPAA compliance side of SMS text message. And is it inherently not those things? Because a lot of EMRs, which 
don't even get me started. I think it's a mess in general. Uh, are trying to adapt some level of SMS just from a, an appointment reminder standpoint, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what, as you kind of alluded to at the beginning, S- text message can be used for in terms of marketing and patient retention and all of that. So a lot of people out there listening are concerned with if they're going to use text message, is it HIPAA compliant? Or or maybe you don't even have to worry about it until X, Y, or Z occurs in the patient interaction. So t- talk to me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I mean, HIPAA compliance, right? It's all about protecting personal health info, right? And so to start with, I mean, context is really important here. There is a difference in any kind of telehealth or any, you know any kind of healthcare service. There is a difference between having a conversation with the patient, scheduling an appointment, asking for a payment or something of that nature versus going into a deep dive of you know their healthcare history or sharing images yeah. of, you know, hey, I have this rash. What do you think about it? Something that I think is is really good for the whole industry and other professionals I've talked to in healthcare agree with this is throughout COVID, there was a loosening of restrictions to make telehealth more accessible and more feasible. And there's a you know a, a sunset on when that piece was put into play, but a lot of states I'm seeing are, are picking it back up to keep it going permanently. Anyway, so I think that's great. It, it, it pretty much negates the conversations or the concerns that people have around HIPAA compliance. And so it, it was beforehand, it was, you know, hey, you can say, talk to your customers or your patients in whatever way you want. If they start sharing, you know, personal health info, you need to redirect that to a secure email or to, you know, a phone call so that those records aren't incidentally shared. Now it's the case where that's a non-issue, and again, I won't. You know, I'm not a lawyer here. This isn't legal advice, you know, and I won't go into the the, the back end of the technical stuff. But yeah, you know, it's pretty it's pretty much a non-issue. And so what it does is that opens the door, I think, for a lot of people to get in where you know, a, kind of across healthcare practices, you know, the free consultation is a common offer to get people in the door. And you know, nowadays some people don't want necessarily to come in for a free consultation. They want to ask two or three questions online or through a text um, and have answers to see if it's worth coming in or worth scheduling an appointment or going through the insurance headache. And that is that's an open door now. So does that does that answer or was that more of just a ramble? No, I'm no it, it makes a lot of sense. So pretty much it's I mean there's an open door in terms of especially front end. I think that the designation that you gave is really important because we have a lot of, I think, providers and and healthcare organizations that are confused with that where HIPAA kind of starts and ends. And again, I I think patient security or just kind of security of um, contact info in general is always a best practice. Like you should have an SSL certificate. You should be encrypting your form data that's being delivered from your site, whatever it is. But somebody like using SMS text message as like a list builder or a front end marketing funnel, those types of things, HIPAA doesn't really get involved until you start having that, that kind of back and forth engagement. Um, especially obviously, like you said, once you get into the whole patient care ecosystem, that's obviously straight HIPAA. But like people say that all the time to me about, well, if somebody goes and fills out a form on our website, there can be a HIPAA issue there and we need to keep it encrypted. It's like, well, people can give... I wouldn't recommend like collecting their entire life history in a form because that's more information than you need. But if somebody goes and fills out a form on your website to book an appointment or a lead form... Like they are, they're the one that's doing that from a from that standpoint. But I think from the text message, what you said, what's interesting is it sounds like people are over worrying. Not that HIPAA shouldn't always be obviously a front end concern, but there's a lot more leeway as far as what you can do in the use of text message from a patient communication standpoint without having to feel like um, HIPAA is being lorded over you. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And it makes sense to you think about it from a, a lawyer's perspective, right? Their job is to protect you as much as possible and make sure you are in, you have no threat of a lawsuit or any kind of um, negative consequence. And so it makes sense for them to be over careful. So I get that. But there's also a, a lot of leeway and there's plenty of precedent for this too. You know, even if a, a patient starts sharing very personal health info, that should be protected. Yeah, for sure. It's them sharing it as well. And, you know, then it's, it, then the provider is, it's up to them to say, okay, hey, do we want to redirect this to a different channel? Is it okay to keep this going? Some of that depends on how sensitive the conversation is. But it's, again, a pretty much an open door now. So I, I love on the podcast, and one of my favorite things to do kind of in general is, especially the type of learner that I am, I think a lot, 
a lot of the listeners to um, being healthcare executives and practitioners, the way they learn is through examples. So I'd love to talk through a couple kind of use cases in terms of marketing that you've seen. I've got a good one too. Text message being used effectively to either retain patients or on the front end of the marketing funnel, kind of grow their, their both their text as well as email list and obviously bring patients through the door, which is another big concern. So I'd love to hear if you've got a good example of kind of how, how you've seen text message being used to great effect. And then I've got a, a good example as well. Yeah, absolutely. So my favorite one is on the front end of, of bringing new patients in. And maybe that's just because I'm biased because I'm in marketing. But <laughs> That's what I was my example is going to be too. That's my favorite part. Right. Okay. Well, maybe I'll share two then. So one on either side. So it's not uh, only on one's, one piece of it. But uh, my favorite one is like I mentioned before, texting from the website. And so in our case in particular, we have a, we call it an SMS chat. It looks like a, a typical live chat widget that goes on your website. But what happens is it starts a text message conversation. So they, the patient comes to your website, they have a quick question before they want to book or, you know, they want to see, hey, do you accept my insurance or you know, is this worth me coming in for or what have you? And a lot of, in most cases, it's easier for someone to just ask a question than to try to scour your website for an answer. For sure. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've seen that be really effective because it starts the conversation. And then because it goes, it turns it into a text combo. So it would come in, in our case, it would, you know, the message comes into your text quest dashboard. Whenever you respond, it goes to that contact cell phone and their messages. And we've seen that be really effective for actually closing a new patient or a new deal or scheduling a new appointment uh, because they don't have to wait around on your website because sometimes you need a good bit of back and forth. Um, it also takes some of the burden off of the provider for having to respond instantly. I mean, you know, if you respond to a text message within, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes, people are perfectly fine. If you don't respond to a live chat within a minute and a half, people leave. And the amount of uh, call inundation. I know that's been a big, big issue across the board for a lot of practices is they're just having to literally staff people just to be able to answer enough phone calls. And that's a big burden. It's a it's a time suck. It's a cost suck. It creates um, higher levels of overhead. Like we've got large ortho practices that literally have like developed call centers overnight as a result of COVID for things like you're talking about that can really be handled in a quick back and forth, answer a couple questions, and you differentiate yourself from 98% of other practices that have horrible response times and give you this not so good feeling before you ever even potentially book a, an appointment with them. Absolutely. And it, you know, one person can handle 10 times the number of text conversations as they can phone calls, if not more. Yep. So that becomes really easy. Um, one other example I'll share on the back end is... People often for in healthcare, you know, they schedule an appointment whenever they feel a need for it so badly that they can't avoid it anymore. There, I mean, whether you're a dentist and you're trying to bring people in every six months, or you're even, you know, a chiropractor or something more serious, you know, people look for reasons not to go, right? And they forget. I mean, life happens. And so one thing I'm a fan of is just texting your patients regularly based on when they need to schedule their next appointment. You know, hey. You know, it's been six months since your last dental appointment. We've got openings, you know, Tuesday and Thursday next week. Do you want to come in? Or if there's a last minute cancellation, you know, you can fill that spot pretty quickly. But we've seen that be huge for attention as well. Yeah, because I mean, it's the same with every time a plane takes off and a seat is empty. It's the same thing with a practice, especially if you're a surgeon is when you've got an empty clinic room or you got an empty chair as a dentist, that is that that lost revenue, it's gone. And so getting those type, especially if you have a service line offering like chiropractic, dental, the types of things that require people to walk back through the door in some regular interval, you've got to get them back through the door. And that's where a text message can be really highly effective. Absolutely. And so now I'm really curious, Justin, what's your example? Yeah, so we have this example is a little old, but we've used it. We've actually adopted this example more times over. So this is kind of the the birth of of, of a funnel that we've used uh, to great effect. So we had a mental health provider that we wanted to build an email or text message list. We were kind of at that crossroads. Like, do we build an email list? Do we build a text message list? That kind of stuff. Like, which way do we go with it? So we created a daily mental motivation text message. So every single day at 8 a.m. in your time zone, you got whether it was a quote or a message or something to 
get you motivated, just like a feel good text message. And we use that really simple landing page interface to sign up and a quick text message opt in. And it exploded. Like, I mean, it just exploded. Like, we had thousands and thousands of people sign up for the text messages in the first month. And so, obviously, you're going to have people kind of coast to coast, but locally, we could start segmenting and it was just a really easy way. Not only was it just cool from the standpoint of a good kind of legacy builder and a thought leadership builder for the provider because it obviously immediately opened up his audience nationwide to a lot of people. But it was really effective for an easy way to open the door and begin a trust building exercise with patients from all over the state that they could do virtual visits with. And he had patients from all over the world. So his his book of business was a little more open, which was great. But even if you're listening and it's a statewide model and you can see people, we use that to really great effect because it's just there's no there's like no barrier to entrance. You just want to get a positivity text message. But then you can obviously Obviously, put them through nurture sequencing over a time to build um, a no like and trust relationship with them as a provider. So then when they do want to take an extra step and meet with you about whatever type of care that you provide, you're obviously going to be front of mind and you're already in their pocket. So that was that was fun. And, and uh, I, I love that because that stuff is to me, it, it, the buying cycle is longer in terms of like seeing an ROI on it. But you just get it for pennies in the dollar. It's like why we love quizzes so much too, because they just they crush it. And so that's that's one that we've seen and used um, in a couple different uh, specialties uh, across the board over the years um, to great effect. Yeah, I love that. And you're talking about it specifically for mental health or mental health practice. Yeah, I it brings to mind too that someone an individual's relationships with their social connections has a huge impact on their health outcomes right and so if you i mean if if you care about providing you know great health outcomes and improving those over time something something like this where you can build that relationship be a, a constant presence that people learn from can be inspired by can feel connected to have that relationship it's going to be better all the way around and then i mean people want to bring it back to an roi too i think there's enough value in it just doing that you know creating better health health outcomes excuse me but also when you when you do that and you create those great experiences and those great relationships more people are going to or more of your patients are going to tell others about you or something's going to come in conversation they're going to say you know oh hey well how was your appointment or um you've been smiling a lot lately i'm so glad to see it you know what's changed and and that's going to be invaluable as well yeah I, i i couldn't agree more and I mean, I think that to me, from like an entrepreneurial minded standpoint, I'm like such a big believer in like the ability to create kind of a, a tribe or a network is really one of the, the most effective things that you can do. I think a lot of people learn that the hard way in COVID. They kind of ignored their patient population in terms of actually building an engaged tribe on social media or with a membership course offering or whatever it may be. And then that evaporated for like 90 days during the lockdown. It's like, well, we have nobody listening anymore. And so when you build something like that, there's so many things down the road that that opens it up to. Like in this instance, like you can build like a, a, a course about mental well-being or, or something like that using that text message list of 50,000 people. Like there's just so many other things that you can do that will positively impact patients' lives. And then as an entrepreneur that you can turn that list into in terms of a valuable resource as you build it. And I think a lot of MDs inherently want to have influence and thought leadership and a personal brand. And that's another powerful way to do that too. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you all the way through. It makes me think too, you know, patients are a lot like children. They remember who shows up, right? Who's yep. there for them. And if you can be there for your patients ongoing, then one, it's great. It's all the things that you just shared, but it also provides a, an upsell opportunity ongoing. Maybe you have a special something, you know, if you're if it's applicable to your practice and you, you know, so you've been there for them and then you say, Hey, well, we've got 20% off of this, or we've got a, you know, a free, whatever, if you refer a friend, they're also going to be more apt to take advantage of that offer as well. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And there's, there's an audience for everybody. Uh, And I think that that's another important thing is, 
it's like, well, that's easy to say if you're a chiropractor or you're in an aesthetics or med spa space, that kind of thing. But like, I, and I bring it up if, if listeners out there that listen to our podcast a lot have heard me reference uh, Dr. Puglisi, one of our long clients and close friends. If him as an infectious disease physician that's talking about immunodeficiencies and CVID and lupus can have such an engaged and passionate community because they have somebody fighting for them as far as like on the front lines not just settling for a run-of-the-mill diagnosis, but investigating and, and being a champion for the patient, then there's an audience for everybody. I mean, he has people reaching out from him from all over the world. Like I've had CVID my whole life and I've never seen anybody like it really investigating, being as passionate as you are, solving problems for patients and, and listening to us and all of that. And so I always like to bring that up because it's true. And honestly, the more kind of carved out your niches and more specific it is, the more engaged your audience is going to be. And so there's never... uh, I think people are scared, well, there's this is way too specific what I do. And that's just simply not the case. Yeah, there are riches and niches, right? I mean, we've seen exactly what you're talking about. We've seen for um, just offhand pulmonologists, plastic surgeons. Yeah. You know, cancer specialists and and varieties. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're... All over the board. We were talking the other day with one of our clients that's in the vestibular rehab and kind of balance training. So a lot of audiology and brought up there's an audiologist that's younger that he just talks about all different types of audiology stuff. He's got like 300,000 YouTube subscribers and several of his videos have millions and millions and millions of views. There's an audience out there for everybody. I, I mean... To get to get really into the the popular side of things, you know, there's the uh, you know Doctor Pimple Popper, right? Like, oh yeah, as much sure. as you yeah. want to go, it's there. Yep, yeah, and there's people out there that'll watch it. That's my my wife's one of them, not to, <laughs> not me. All right, so anything else? So I know you brought up some things at the beginning. But in terms of the patient life cycle, there's obviously a lot of different touch points on the patient care continuum. Is there anywhere else that you see maybe that we haven't talked about potentially that text message can be used to good effect uh, to improve kind of the patient journey in general? I think one piece we've seen really effectively, and I touched on this just briefly, but feedback right after the at, right after the appointment. You know, if you give someone a form to fill out, or you say, "Hey, uh, we'll email you this or whatever," you know, we have study after study showing that people um, there's about a 600% lift in responses when you just text someone and ask them, or you know, give them a short survey to to complete. And to me, that's a, it's a very small thing that's really helpful and impactful because that's what you use to improve your practice for quality assurance, to make sure things are running smoothly. And then it also gives you a great opportunity to ask them for either a public online review, which you know is free marketing for you. And then to later, you know, you've got that engagement, you already have that open channel in their cell phone or in their text messages to, you know, then text them later for an appointment reminder or a promotion or, you know, sharing some thought leadership. Like, so that that's something that stands out, I think is, is really valuable. And also, I mean, if anyone has a concern about HIPAA or marketing or compliance, which obviously I feel very comfortable, you know, in all those use cases, but even if you have those concerns, this is one that does that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think that that's... A really big one. And I mean, I I just think, and the closer, as you mentioned, to the patient point of care, the higher conversion rates that you're going to get to. It's just while it's fresh on people's minds before they get going back with their life, trying to get it as close to the patient point of care, the more likely it is that they'll follow through with it too. Absolutely. All right. So Kenneth, as we wrap up, tell me how a people can get connected directly with you. But more importantly, you mentioned text request a couple times. How can people get a demo, get signed up, learn more about text requests as well? Yeah. So for me personally, I mean, I can give you my email. It's Kenneth at textrequest.com. Pretty simple. I'm heavily active on LinkedIn. So you can look me up there, connect with me there. Happy to chat with anyone as well. If you're interested in learning more about text requests or seeing the product firsthand, you can go to textrequest.com. There is a demo button right there, or you can just go to textrequest.com forward slash demo. Get a time. One of our you know, subject matter experts would be happy to talk with you one-on-one or talk with your team. And you know, we can do anything from just showing you how the product works to strategizing and talking through what you have. Just reach out. Excellent. We will have all of those links inside of the show notes too, as we always do. So you can go there too and definitely get connected with Kenneth. Kenneth, thanks for coming on. Also an announcement, we have a 
local SEO webinar that is coming up uh, in May. So make sure you go to the website and check that out. We'll be talking about how to rank your treatments, conditions, and surgeries number one in local search. So I'm excited about that topic as well as we will be giving away to any attendee, a potential attendee a $3,500 SEO audit and strategy for an attendee of that webinar. So excited about that. Look forward to having everybody on the webinar. And Kenneth, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to today's latest episode of the Patient Convert Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and review on your favorite podcast platform. We are on Apple, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and Spotify, or you can sign up to receive the latest episode via email. Just check it out on my agency website or my personal website. And if you are looking for more amazing healthcare marketing information or just to engage, check us out at entropy.com. And for any of my amazing physician liaisons out there interested in growing their physician referrals or learning the strategy strategies that it takes to build highly engaged physician referral networks. Check out my website, kellynot.com, where I have free webinars, free downloads, and of course, my online physician liaison training course, Physician Liaison University. And as always, I'm a huge believer in connecting, engaging, and supporting one another. And the best way we can do that is networking. And I always, always connect with you guys on social media. And one of my biggest social media platforms is LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me there on LinkedIn or Instagram or Twitter at Kelly Knott. And thank you guys again for listening to the Patient Convert Podcast with your host, Kelly Knott.